18, God compels us together to reach a massive city. Mexico City is a free for all. A lot of traffic. Millions and millions of people. They are not an isolated country full of mariachis. Coming in from Europe, South America, from unreached people groups, and we want to follow those lines to take the gospel all over the world. Our team, we are a small representation of what Mexico is. Different experiences, different backgrounds. We're only a team of 12 people, but we can't reach them by ourselves. We're seeking to be catalytic in the way that we're working. Invitan para conferencias, el internet, el Skype. Mentoring with guys who are interested in pastoring or missions. Seminaries. The local churches. We cannot do it alone. God's still calling people to reach all the nations. thankful for the 3,600 international missionaries who serve in our interest and most importantly in the interest of the Lord Jesus Christ around the globe today. And we have a privilege to uh, be able to invest in the work that they are doing and in the additional missionaries that will be commissioned and be sent through the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering. 100% of what is received through this offering every year goes to fund the work of our missionaries. Our campus-wide goal, as you well know, is $750. And so if everybody here on campus would just uh, pitch in $10 uh, towards this offering, I think we can meet and even exceed that goal. And we're always faithful to do that. So let me say thank you in advance. We have as our chapel speaker today, uh, Pastor Dustin Sims, he is a 2006 alum of Clear Creek. I, actually, when we were talking, I thought I heard 96, and I was looking at him thinking, 96? Brother, you're not that old. And, and so then he heard me say it back to him. He's like, oh, no, no, 2006. And so 2006 grad of Clear Creek, and, and we're thankful he's one of our alums, pastor of Horse Creek Baptist Church. That's over in Clay County, Kentucky, Manchester. And so he's a next-door neighbor to where I serve there in Knox County uh, as well. And also some of you have probably had him in class. He is an adjunct professor here at Clear Creek. He is working on, about to finish up, a doctoral degree. And so we pray for him as he continues that, uh, that endeavor. Uh, this morning, unspoken prayer request by a show of hands. Amen. The Lord knows those needs. I think Brother Colin has a surgery that's coming up uh, here towards the end of the week. And so we pray uh, for him. I mentioned him last week in chapel, but they were unable to get him in last week. And so hopefully by the end of this week, he'll have that procedure completed. Well, let's pray together and then we'll worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, we praise your high and holy name. We thank you that you are our God and Lord, that you have loved us and sent your son, Lord, to die for us, to save us from our sin, Father. Lord, we just pray that you would move and work in this place through the songs that we sing, the worship of your name. Lord, through your word that is preached, Father, may you just uh, anoint your servant, Father, fill his lungs with the breath of your Holy Spirit, loose his tongue, help him to preach today in the leading and the strength and the power of your spirit. Father, may you bring healing to the sick, bring salvation to the lost, comfort to those that are troubled, Father. And Lord, we do pray for the work of international missions that's going on all around the world. Father, we pray that you would give them fruit for their labor, that we would see countless souls saved for the glory of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together at Clear Creek and worship our Savior. When the music fades, all is stripped away. Just to breathe something that's the word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way.
Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being holy, holy, holy. God, we are not righteous, no, not one. But thanks to your son, Jesus Christ, you view us through the blood of Christ. Thank you, God. We did nothing to deserve it, Lord. But Lord, thank you for that love. Thank you for the peace that only you can give. And may you have all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor in all that is done here today, Lord. And may we continue to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There were thousands of them. People were everywhere. At least 5,000 of them were men. Well, you know how men are always hungry. They followed us along the shores. It's not our fault. And now, it was time to eat. But guess what? None of these stupid people brought any food. And now, our rabbi has just told us to feed them. Uh, we got a problem. Send them all to McDonald's. There's not any here. Well, then send them to town. I've already suggested that, but the rabbi said for us to feed them. Yeah, right. No, I'm serious. That's what he said. Do you have any idea how much that will cost? Well, maybe we misunderstood him. No, he said for us to feed them. That's going to take more than any of us could earn in eight months. Uh, well, it's not our fault they followed us around the lake. Yeah, couldn't they tell we were trying to get away? I bet not even a single one of them could pay us back. It's not fair. Uh, this was supposed to be a retreat with our rabbi, not some kind of mission project. Yeah, even if we did have that kind of food, or money, do you know how long it would take for us to pass it all out? I agree, it's an impossible task. You go tell him. No, he'll start questioning our faith again. Faith? What's faith got to do with it? Uh, we've got thousands of hungry people out there. We don't need faith. We need tons of food and lots of help. Maybe we need to get back in the boat and leave. Yeah, this isn't our responsibility. Now wait, wait a minute. We all know this isn't our fault. And we all know that this is an impossible task. But he did ask us to do it, so let's at least give it a try. Alright. Maybe Father Moses will drop some men out of the sky or something. Or some money. Let's see if we can find some crackers or something. Just so he'll know we tried. Well, did anyone find anything? Uh, I found this kid with a sack lunch. It's got, let's see, five pieces of bread and two pieces of pickled fish. Pickled fish? I get the bread. No, no, we're not going to eat it ourselves. We're going to take it to the rabbi and show him that we tried. He already knows about it. In fact, he uh, wants us to get all these people to sit down. Why? I think he's going to feed them. One sack lunch? This is getting embarrassing. I'm getting back in the boat. You've had a bad day? Well, let me just have my day with your son. Talk about being embarrassed. I wanted to crawl underneath nearest duty and rock. Okay, so we went out for the day and we heard that the teacher, everyone's talking about Jesus, you know, he was teaching us out of our town. So I told your son that we were going to pack the lunch. Well, you know, I had to run to the laundry, I had to go get water, and I had to run to the market. So, I mean, there was no time for me to break any fresh bread. Man, I was so embarrassed. There's no worries, though. We had leftover bread from last night's supper. So what did I do? I put the bread with the parcels of fish, and we took it for lunch. Okay, so now we're on the hillside, and I'm talking with Mary, the lady who lives down the road. Everyone's getting restless. It's so hot. It's been a long day, and we've been there all day. So I turned to ask your son to bring the basket so we could have lunch. When poof, he disappeared. I mean, he was gone. I mean, it was such a crowd, I was so frantic. I looked and I looked and I could not find him. So then I asked Mary, she got her husband to help, she got her husband to help me look, and she looked at me and she said, look down there where the teacher Jesus is. I mean, come on. Yes, yes, it was him. But wait, what is your son doing? 
He's feeding our lunch to Jesus' followers, day-old leftovers. Oh my goodness, I'm so embarrassed. I mean, why didn't I get up early and bake any fresh bread? I mean, I would have if I knew he was going to share it with the master. But when I finally reached your son, the basket was gone. It's not really a worry, but I'm just so happy that we were able to gather that crowd. People are so sarcastic and so rude. They were cheering and clapping and making fun of us. But it's a miracle we got out of that crowd. What has Jesus asked you to do that you thought was impractical, that you thought you couldn't afford? Has he asked you to fix a problem that wasn't your fault? Has he asked you to care for people you don't even know? We each came home that day, all 12 of us, carrying these baskets of leftovers. And these baskets are always reminding us that nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, is, is impossible, impossible with, with God. God. is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our, Our Father in heaven, your, your name be honored as holy. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Your, your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You, you prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. Give us today our daily bread. My cup overflows. You anoint my head with oil. Forgive us our debts, as, as we have forgiven our debtors. Only goodness and faithful love who pursue me all the days of my life. Do not bring us into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. We will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as we live. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's good to see every one of you here. Some of you I've had in class and uh, get to see you again. Some of you have never met me before. But uh, as Brother Josh said, uh, my name is Dustin Sims. And uh, just a couple of things that, uh, uh, as far as introduction wise, um, I am uh, happily married, been married for, for quite a while, since 2004. Uh, we met and married here uh, at Clear Creek. And uh, just a special place here. We have three children. Uh, two biological children, and we have one from Thailand that uh, came to us as an exchange student and stayed a second year. She's now at the University of Kentucky, and uh, we, we still we claim her as our own. And, uh, and so for at one point in our household, we had three teenagers uh, in our house, two of them being teenage girls. And so every single day, we were, you know, we didn't know what the day, it was a roller coaster. I mean, it was up and down, up and down, and so, uh, but what a privilege it is to be here. And, and, and actually, this is, uh, it's kind of interesting, this is the first time I've ever preached uh, here at Clear Creek. Uh, first time, I didn't do senior chapel when I was here. Um, I, never, uh, I never took the opportunity to do that, so I'm excited to be here this morning. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. As we uh, take a look at a, at a subject that oftentimes is uh, uh, really kind of neglected in a sense. And what I mean by that, it's, it's viewed in the wrong way. And then as it's viewed in the wrong way, oftentimes uh, we, can, we can tend to, uh, to twist it in a way that, uh, uh, that's not biblical. And I say this because 
in your ministry, no matter where you're going to serve, no matter what you're going to do, uh, this is going to be an important subject for you. And it was something I actually learned here at Clear Creek, uh, not while I was on campus here, but while I was at school, and, and I went home to, uh, to, be, uh, to attend my grandmother's funeral. And I'll never forget, I was actually in uh, uh, clinical pastoral training class uh, with Dr. Sulfords. He, he was teaching the class, uh, and we actually met over there in the, in the music building, and uh, I, we had to write on grief. And I wrote the paper, and as I wrote the paper, you know, it just, it was kind of one of those things where, you know, we did it, but, but I really didn't understand it at that particular time. And then as I, as I went to my grandmother's funeral, I'll never forget, my, my mom got up in the middle of the funeral, and she went to the back, and as she went to the back, uh, I got up to, you know, to go comfort her, and as I went back there, I hugged her, and she cried, and, and then she, she walked away. Well, my pastor uh, that I had surrendered the ministry under came back there to me. And, you know, and I never, you know, I, at that point I hadn't cried. I hadn't experienced anything like that. I just, you know, I was just there at the funeral. And he come up to me and he hugged me and he said, uh, he said, I, I know you don't think of this right now. And then I start crying. And he said, but what you're going through right now is actually going to benefit you, not, you know, that your grandmother's dying, but what you're experiencing now is going to help you in ministry. Because when you're dealing and you're, you're ministering to those who are grieving, you're going to be able to remember this because of what you experience. You experiencing grief is going to, to help you in how you minister to others. And I never thought of that, you know, during that time. Obviously, I wasn't thinking about that, but he was right. The experiences that God has brought in my life paired with the, the training and, and teaching that I received here at Clear Creek and even, even beyond here has been, go hand in hand, and it's taught me so much. And so what I want to talk to you about today is not grief. I was using that as a, as a way of introduction. But the concept of comfort. Because in that particular moment is when I got to experience the comfort of God. Now, when we talk about the comfort of God, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, there, there's no greater place to, uh, to be than that particular chapter. And as we look here, we're going to see Paul talk about the comfort of God. But it's not in the way that we think. And if we're not careful, we'll cheapen the grace of God by not recognizing exactly what Paul is saying here in this particular passage of Scripture. Read with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You also joining in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you help us to recognize right now as we gather together that when we open up your word, we encounter your word, you have something to say to us. And we need to listen. We need to be ready to, to respond. Lord, we can't come to your word, read your word, and not respond one way or the other. Either we're going to be obedient or we're going to choose to ignore and disobey. But I pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts. And I pray that you would draw us this morning. And I pray that you would remind us this morning that even as we are studying for the ministry, as many in here are and many of us are in ministry and we've gone through and, and Lord, we, we are still, still learning and growing, that we never, ever, ever can do it without you. That it cannot happen. And Lord, I pray now that you would bless this time. May you speak to our hearts. I thank you and praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1943, on New Year's Day, Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote a letter. And he said this, he said, I believe that God can, can and will bring out good out of evil, even out of the greatest evil. For that purpose, he needs men who make the best use of everything. 
I believe that God will give us all the strength we need to help us to resist in all time of distress. But he never gives it in advance. At least we should rely on ourselves and not on him alone. A faith such as this should ally all of our fears for the future. I believe that even our mistakes and shortcomings are turned to good account and that it is no harder for God to deal with them than with our supposedly good deeds. I believe that God is no timeless fate, but that he waits and answers sincere prayers and responsible actions. And upon this conviction, Diedrich Bonhoeffer endured imprisonment and eventually died at the hands of the Nazis. Now we can spend a lot of time debating and and, and uh, evaluating Bonhoeffer's theology in a, in a lot of areas. But one thing we can be sure of is that he was faithful and faithful in serving God no matter what. And so as we look here, what we find is, is what, what Bonhoeffer experienced in, in prison was the comfort of God. As we think about the comfort of God, now, I read all through verse 11. We're not going to get through verse 11. Uh, in fact, we're probably not even going to get fa- past the first point. Unless on that, that schedule it, say, it gives me 40 hours instead of 40 minutes. Uh, we, we don't have time to deal with every single verse here. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is the comfort of God, the comfort that we receive from the Lord. If you look in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now what we understand here is Paul lays out this concept of comfort. Is Paul reminds us first and foremost that it starts with God. Look, notice what he says here. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Now, as he talks about this, what Paul, uh, Paul lays out here as Paul talks about comfort is he helps us to understand that it comes from God. Now, we need to understand this word comfort. As we talk about comfort, we need to understand it's not what we think when we think of comfort. It's not this pat on the back, it's going to be okay, and, and it softens the blow. It's nothing like that. The concept of comfort here is not something that dulls the pain or even takes it away. The concept of comfort that is laid out in this particular passage of Scripture is a word that means encouragement. It doesn't imply that God rescues us from the danger. It doesn't imply that God rescues us from every every discomfort. It doesn't do that at all. In fact, what it means is that He gives us the tools and endurance to go through it. That's what it means. You see, and I say that because so often in today's circles, in many, uh, 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 there's much false teaching that goes on out there that tends to want to say, you know, God, God's going to give you everything that, that, that you know, is going to make it all soft on you. Everything's going to be great. You're not going to experience anything. In fact, we have, uh, we have, you have, there's believers uh, probably in many churches around, and I've experienced it myself, that believe that, uh, that if you just, you believe hard enough or if you quote some certain psalm or do something like that, that nothing bad will ever happen to you. That's not what we see in Scripture. In fact, it cheapens the grace of God through this. You see, the concept of comfort here that Paul talks about is God giving us the tools to endure, the endurance to, uh, to, to, and the guidance to, to move through. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. You see, through this comfort, we know God better. It's through this that we know God better, through these issues. Now, as Paul, Paul describes here, you notice his description. He's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Paul's able to say that because he's experienced it. Paul's able to say that. If you go down and you look, Paul talks about in verse 8, uh, that we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our affliction which came to us in Asia, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Now, we don't know exactly what all Paul endured there in Asia, uh, but we know Paul, as he's writing this letter, it had something to do with the Corinthians uh, because of what he, uh, he endured in, in, in sending Titus to them and Titus not returning and, 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 and Paul being upset and, and having an issue there with the Corinthians and it being attacked in Corinth as these, uh, these uh, false teachers would come in and they were, they were calling Paul he wasn't a real apostle and, 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 and all these things because Paul experienced so much suffering. It reminds me today of, of the concept of people saying, uh, you know, uh, you know if, 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 you, if you just serve God, if you do what's right, if you're in his will, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And, and if, you, if you, something bad's happening to you, you just don't believe enough. That's what I think about when I think about these opponents here of Paul. You know, he's not really an apostle. He, he can't really be, an, if he's experiencing all this suffering, he can't really be a follower of Jesus Christ. Or if he is, he's not following him right. But Paul says, don't worry about me. Let me tell you about the God of all comfort. Let me tell you, what he's shown me through these afflictions. Let me tell you what he's shown me through these heartaches. David Garland says, we know God's promises best when we're in direct need of them. We're in direct need of them. That's what Paul speaks about here. This comfort comes from God because he is the God of all comfort. And see, what Paul says here, Paul has a greater understanding of God. I I always think about, when I read this, I always think about Job. 
You know, at the end of Job there when he says, uh, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but when he says, uh, I had heard about you, but now I know you. Now my eyes have seen you. I've experienced He's experienced God in this. But notice what he does here. He says he's the, he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what's amazing about this is Paul is Paul's being attacked, and he's going to deal with a lot of attacks in this particular letter, and, 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 and he's going to do that quite a bit uh, through this letter. But every time Paul deals with an attack, he never makes it about himself. He always brings it back to God. He always brings it back to Christ. That's what he does here. They're saying, Paul's not a real apostle. And he says, let me tell you about God. Let me tell you what God's done through this. I can show you, I can demonstrate to you that, that, that uh, uh, God has, has, has moved in my life. I can demonstrate to you who God is from the life that I've lived and what God has done in my life. You see, the greatest comfort we see here is he talks about God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest comfort we can see here is that, is that God the Father is the one who, who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. As he sent his son and he was crucified he, and, and, and he, he experienced our suffering, God knows. God knows his son was, was crucified for us. He may not always remove the affliction. He may not always take it away. But he always comforts us by giving us what we need to face them. And what's amazing about this, as God does this, we experience who God is. And we experience his comfort on a greater level than we ever could before. By enduring it, by going through it. And I tell you all this because in ministry you're going to experience it. It's going to happen. You may have a compliment given to you, but I guarantee you probably later on that afternoon somebody's going to call and they're going to tell you something they don't like. Or you're going to get those calls that say, Pastor, I need to talk to you about something. But they won't tell you what it is. Well, we'll talk some of it. No, let's talk right now. You know, I'm that type. You know, I, I had a lady call me one time and she said, I need to talk to you about something later on. And I got in the car and drove to her house. I said, let's talk right now. I can't stand to sit and wait. And wait for to figure out what, what exactly, you know, what the problem is. Because usually when they call, it's not going to be, I can't wait to tell you how, how great things are going. Or I can't wait to tell you how excited I am about this or that. No, it's usually something that, that's going to be bad. So you're going to need the comfort of God. In fact, that's the only thing that gets you through it. But notice here what he says here. He says in verse 4, who comforts us in all our afflictions. It's not just some affliction, but all our affliction. And what he says here, when he, when he uses the word affliction, it's, it's not just talking about something external. It means external and internal. The, the, the stress, Paul, Paul would talk about later on in the letter how he was distressed over the fact that he had sent Titus to them uh, with the, the letter of tears and Titus returning back. And he didn't know exactly how the Corinthians were going to respond. He didn't know if it was going to make them more upset. And when he got to, to Macedonia, uh, Titus wasn't there. He, he, didn't know, he didn't know where Titus was. Paul was concerned. He was worried. Paul had all these, these, uh, these feelings going on. It wasn't just external in what he was experiencing in the persecution but internal as well he was tore apart and Paul would say even to death that's how, how stressed he was that's how, how, how much uh, pain Paul was dealing with but Paul says here he says, uh, he, he says that uh, this affliction it, that, Paul, that God comforts us in all of our affliction notice what he says there so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction Paul's able to, to write about this and he's able to tell them, and he's able to, to talk about this comfort that God has given him because he's experienced it. And he's able to demonstrate to them. His opponents were saying that he wasn't a real apostle, and Paul says, no, look at my life. Look, look at what, what God has done in my life. I can show you, I can demonstrate to you and tell you about the comfort of God. And here's what's amazing about this. As Paul talks about this, Paul's not just simply writing this. Paul's experienced it. He knows. He comforts us in all of our afflictions so we're able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, as you think about this, uh, those of you who've been through hermeneutics, you know, uh, one of the things that you see is uh, if, it, if there's a word that's repeated, you know, that's what the subject is. And notice how many times Paul keeps saying comfort, 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 affliction and comfort, affliction and comfort. Paul understood. Paul was able to, to write this because Paul experienced a great deal of affliction, but he also experienced the comfort of God. And here's what's amazing about this. As Paul writes this and he says this, he gives us a great theological truth here that we need to understand. If you look down and you see Paul says in verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia. We were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves 
so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. What Paul experienced there and what we need to be reminded of today is as Paul uh, was afflicted, as he experienced the pain and the suffering and all that, he got to experience the comfort of God. And sometimes God will take you out of it. Sometimes God will, will move you through it. But what Paul understood in that is Paul learned to trust in the God who raises from the dead. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Because every time we experience the comfort of God and he brings us through it, we get a taste of what it will be like in the ultimate deliverance through the resurrection. That's what we get to experience. That's why when we say, God, God's just going to give you all good things and you're not going to experience any heartache, you're not going to experience any affliction, it cheapens the grace of God. Because when we experience these things in life and because we live in a world that is sinful and we, 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 we're, we're a light to go into a dark world, we're going to experience these things. But what's amazing about this is in that comfort, in that deliverance, whether it's through it, whether it's out of it, maybe, we, uh, maybe God takes us on, whatever it may be, we're ultimately delivered and we get a taste of what it will be like. One day when God delivers us. Of what it will be like when God delivers us. It was amazing. Several, uh, several weeks ago, I had an opportunity to, um, to talk to, uh, through Zoom, um, uh, several, several uh, um, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they were in India and Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal. There was a few countries, and uh, there was 157 of them on Zoom. I don't even know how it kept up. Uh, with it. There was a lot on there. And I, and I got to teach this very thing. And it was amazing to me that regardless of, of culture, regardless of distance or whatever, this message resonated. And, and, and it was amazing to see. And what was so amazing about this is at the very end of it, at the very end of, of, of me speaking, he, he allowed each one who wanted to say something, to say something. Now, I, I couldn't understand everything that they said, but one of the things that, that they kept saying over and over and, and many of them are, you know, in, in India, there's, you know, the government one way or the other. You know, one day they may be okay with, with Christianity, the next day they may not be. Uh, and there's, there's a constant battle back and forth and a constant uh, persecution in, in, in these other places as well. And, and here's what's amazing. In all of that, no matter what they're, and they had, they had, they had uh, a chance to speak. And all they said was, every one of them, praise God. Praise God. Praise God, right down the line, one right after another. And as I spoke this message, I thought, you know, I experienced affliction and discomfort, things like that. But it's probably nothing about like what they experience. And yet that was the only thing they wanted to say when they had an opportunity to speak. Nothing about what they experienced, nothing about what was going on. And I could see some of their places. Some of it was just a, just a, a block building. Just a block room that had a, had a piece of tin over it. And that was all they had. They had internet. But that was it. And they'd say, praise God. Praise God. And I thought, when they're saying this, I guarantee you they've experienced. They've experienced the comfort of God. You see, what, what Paul says here is Paul says very clearly, that he comforts us in all of our afflictions. And here's what's amazing about this. As he speaks about that, he says, so that we'll be able to comfort those which are in any affliction, verse 4, with the comfort with which we ourselves receive. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. What Paul understood about not only God delivering, not only the fact that, that God uh, brought him through, not only a taste of, of, of what, what is to come, but Paul understood that in his suffering, he had a greater connection to his Savior. He had a greater connection to his Savior. Paul was able to do that. Now, now think about that for just a moment. You, we don't have time to look at every single one of these, but I'll just mention a few of them. In Philippians 3.10, he, he talks about the concept of suffering. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You notice what Paul says there. Paul understood that ultimately as we think about the resurrection that comes in Christ, as we think about the, the ultimate deliverance that comes in Christ, and we think about what awaits us, we know, we know that it comes through, through death. Christ died, and then he rose. And as that happened, as he took our place and he paid the penalty for our sins, when we experience suffering and affliction in this world, we get closer and closer. We get, we get to experience a little bit, nothing like what Christ went through, but a little bit. It connects us to our Savior. Paul, meant, Paul As Paul talks about the suffering of Christ, Paul understood. He said, I may, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, but he said the fellowship of his sufferings. 
He wanted to know the fellowship of severance. What Paul understood was is that his ministry was an extension of Christ's earthly ministry. And indeed, Christ's earthly ministry was full of suffering and hardship that led to the cross. Paul was willing to follow. That's why Paul is able to say in this passage of Scripture, don't look at me. Don't look at what God has done. Don't, don't, don't look at what, what, what I have done. Don't, look about the, don't, don't focus on the suffering. Think about the comfort of God. That's what I want you to see. Now notice Paul's writing this letter. Paul had an opportunity to really lay out all the details of everything he experienced in Asia, everything that happened. You know, what's amazing to me is oftentimes I, I wonder sometimes when we share our testimonies, um, you know, and people, uh, I've heard people say over, you know, I've heard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonies over the years. And what's interesting is if someone has a, if, if someone experienced something really, really bad in their past, and, and, they, and they talk about that a lot, you'll hear people say, now that right there is an amazing testimony. And it is. But I say everybody who's come to know Christ their Lord and Savior, it's an amazing testimony. Amen. It's an amazing testimony. And what, what, what amazes me so many times is, is that we may spend all of our time focusing in on, on uh, 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 all the things that happened before Christ. And then at the end of our testimony, as we're sharing it, we may say, but thank, thank, Christ, thank God that Christ saved me. And that's it. Now, the reason I say that is one of the things I appreciated about my wife when I first met her. My wife had a hard childhood, a very rough childhood. And one of the things that she, she was invited uh, uh, to a ladies' group that was meeting here at Clear Creek, and I'll never forget people coming to me and telling me, about how it went. And, and what she said was this. She said, I can spend all my time telling you about what happened before, what happened in my life growing up. She said, but I don't want to spend all my time talking about what happened before Christ and all the things that, uh, uh, that the enemy used uh, in, in my life and all the terrible things. She said, I could spend all time doing that. She said, I'd rather tell you about what Christ has done in my life and how he's changed my life. I'd rather tell you about what he's doing now in my life. And so she did. She would do that, and she would share her testimony. And, and that was one of the things I appreciated about her so much was that she was willing to, to lay it all about. That's what Paul does. Paul would go over and over and over and over, and he would talk about uh, who, who God, he would bring it back to Christ, and he would talk about uh, who God is because Paul knew that what he was experiencing was not foreign. As he would talk about it, he said, and Peter would say the same, don't, don't think it unusual that you're facing trials. Don't think it at all. Everything needs to come back to Christ. Everything needs to point back to him. And so in 2 Timothy, Paul would say, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. In Philippians 1.29, for it is you has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. 2 Corinthians 4.17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. What Paul understood in all of this and what Peter and the other writers understood is that as believers in Jesus Christ, we will experience suffering. And in experiencing suffering, we get an opportunity to grow closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as that happens, and we experience the comfort of God in our life, we get a, the privilege of being able to see firsthand God's deliverance, a taste of what He will ultimately do one day when we when we're, we, we experience the resurrection. Now let me tell you something. We serve a great God. But you notice what Paul says. He says in verse 5, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also, so also is our comfort in Christ. Now what we understand from that is Paul says the suffering never outweighs the comfort. It never outweighs the comfort. Never at all. So what are we to do with this? Now, we could go on and we could spend some more time and, and things like that, but I, but I want to take a time just to, to give you a few things of application here. How do we apply this? Well, the first key is that we understand the Lord. We grow in our understanding of God. Now, you say, well, what, what does this have to do with anything? Now, notice what Paul says. Paul starts out by, by addressing who God is. He's the God of all comfort. And Paul addresses who God is, and so this comfort comes from him because of who he is. 
So to recognize God's character is not in flux, to recognize that he doesn't, he doesn't go uh, back and forth and back and forth, but to recognize that he is, he is uh, yesterday, uh, today, and tomorrow always the same, to recognize that and grow in our understanding of who God is as we read his word, we spend time with him in relationship, as we grow in that, that is, that is, that is the first key that we need to do. Paul had a great understanding of God because of what he experienced. And so what Paul did, Paul was not glorifying the suffering, he was glorifying God because he recognized who God was. First thing we need to do is grow in our understanding of God. It's not the suffering that teaches us faith, but God. It's not the suffering that brings, that brings about the comfort. It's God who brings about the comfort. And God uses it as a platform to, to, to bring us and to teach us and, and to display his resurrection power in our lives, either deliverance through suffering or deliverance out of it. What we find is we find that we have to grow in our understanding of God. The second key is that we have to have the right understanding of suffering. Now, as we talk about suffering here, it doesn't mean you go look for it, okay? I'm not telling every one of you here this morning, let's go out and let's go look for suffering. I had a friend one time who, 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 said, who thought that very thing. He thought, well, maybe, uh, you know, I should, I should pray for trials or ask for trials and, and things like that. And, and then he quickly learned, no, I don't, need to, I don't need to do that. Suffering comes because we live in a sinful world that is twisted by sin, and we're seeking to take the gospel to a world full of sin. We've been going out on Sunday evenings, um, through the month of through the last part of September and through October, doing the gospel to every home, and uh, as we've been going out, what's been amazing is most people have been receptive, and you know we've had opportunities to talk and, and opportunities to share with them. But we had a few, uh, we, we had a few that uh, uh, that didn't respond very well. In fact, I, I told a deacon of mine, I said, you never should have given this man a high five. They they went up to this man. They were, we went to church fans, so everybody knows where we were. And, uh, this man uh, reached out and he said, give me a high five. And so my deacon reached out and gave him a high five. And as soon as he gave him a high five, that guy snapped. And he threatened to blow up the church, to kill all the preachers. And, and he was a mental, he had mental issues. But uh, he threatened to, 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 do, to do everything that possibly could be done to the church. I said, that was some high five <laughs> that you gave him. And so we've had a few, you know, close the door in our face. You know, you're going to experience that. Because we live in a world that is full of sin. Suffering is going to be experienced by all, although not always to the same degree. Suffering is used by God to teach us. Sometimes he takes us out of it. Sometimes he takes us through it. Either way, we learn the power of God to resurrect. We learn what God is doing, and it points us to what will happen in the future. It's not easy, and it hurts. It doesn't mean that it's going to be that we walk through and we're smiling and everything's great. It hurts. I always tell people, you know, when they experience a, a death, and they'll say, you know, they're a believer in Christ, and I know I should be happy right now, but I just can't be. I know where they are. And I said, you're not wrong. I said, in death, it reminds us that things are not the way they're supposed to be. But the hope we have in Christ points us to say, one day they will be. One day they will be made right. And when we experience the, the suffering, we experience the comfort of God, we get to experience that one day things will be right. They will be made right. And the third key is to have the right focus. And that is not to glorify in the suffering, but to glorify in the Lord. Not to look to the suffering itself, but to look to the Lord and know there's an outcome. God has a purpose. He has a plan. And it was clear to Paul that God doesn't, doesn't protect his people from suffering. Instead, he allows them to go through it. And as he does that, he he. he shows himself to them in a great way. What Paul would say is Paul would say this. Is his hope is beyond anything this world can bring against him because his hope is in Christ. And in that suffering, in that comfort that God provided, he had an opportunity to experience the resurrection power of Christ. Now, it's a privilege it's a privilege that God would use us in the first place. It's a privilege that God would allow us to experience. You know, before I preach, we always have prayer. We always have time, and I always pray that same thing. Lord, we're about to encounter your word. And the reason that I pray that is because we need to recognize the privilege to be able to have the word of God. It's a privilege to be able to, 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 to read who he is. It's a privilege to be able to, to, to uh, that he's revealed himself to us, that he uses us. It's a privilege. But here's the great thing. 
the great thing is, even in the great times, even in the suffering, God shows himself to us. And we get to experience a taste of what will ultimately come. I want to close out with this, this story here. When I went to South Carolina to pastor, it was only my second pastor. And I remember going in, and within a few months' time of being there, we had learned that the current secretary had embezzled money and that the church was owed a half a million dollars to the IRS from back payroll taxes, owed 250000 to the South Carolina Department of Revenue where payroll taxes hadn't been coming in. And I'll never forget, I, I remember being presented with that situation, and none of them knew. And I remember calling Dr. Lucas, and I said, Dr. Lucas, y'all didn't prepare me for this. He said, there ain't no class on this. <laughs> he said, you're going to have to experience it. And he said, in fact, after you get through it, he said, come back to Clicker, you can teach it. <laughs> but I'll never forget, during that time, not only we, we had that, we had a $56,000 air conditioner that, had to, that broke in the sanctuary. We had a $150,000 air conditioner broke in the outreach. All that added together. And I, and I sat there in my office and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I have, I'm not prepared for this. And as I was praying, I felt a comfort and peace of God. Now, he didn't take me out of it. We had to go through it. But I learned more about God in that situation than I ever could have learned. It's, I mean, Clear Creek is a special place, but I never could have learned all I learned about God except going through that. And coming out on the other side, what was amazing to me was as I sat week by week and didn't know whether I was going to get paid or whether we were going to have anything, there'd be people come in off the street, hey, I'm a member here, and I need to get back faithful to God. Here's three years' worth of tithes that I haven't even, I haven't paid in the last three years. And there you go. It would, we'd be able to pay the bills. I'd get to eat, you know. It was, it was amazing. And you know the, the most amazing thing? The church baptized more people during those few years of dealing with that than they had in a long time. And I told, every, I told the congregation, I said, when we first found out, I said, this is the time that people leave the church. But if you leave during this time, you're going to miss the blessing that God has for us through this and on the other side. And what was amazing about it all is during that time, we never had anybody leave. Now, there were some issues after, but we never had anybody leave. God showed himself to us greatly during those times. The comfort will never outweigh. The, the, or excuse me, the suffering will never outweigh the comfort that God provides. And in those situations, you get a taste, taste of God's ultimate deliverance in the future. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time here today. May we learn that as we study here, Many are studying here, as some of us have gone through. We, we know that this is a special place, and we know that you have, Lord, you've blessed this place. And it's amazing. Cannot be overstated how valuable Clear Creek is and how you bless, Lord. It's valuable because you bless. It's valuable because you've, you've led. It's valuable because you've, you've provided. Lord, I pray that we would recognize this morning that you teach us outside of the classroom as well. And as we experience and we go through life, may we not glory in the sufferings, may we not glory in the heartaches, may we not glory in the, in the things that, that we experience, may we glory in you. May your name be lifted up in our lives. And may we praise you. Lord, I'm thankful for who you are and, and the comfort that you bring us, and that you give us a taste 
of what you will do ultimately one day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that no matter what we experience in life, we can look to you and know that you love us and know that you're leading and there's a purpose and there's a plan. We thank you, Lord. I pray your blessings on Clear Creek for each and every student here and all the faculty and staff and everybody who's here, Lord. I just pray that your hand continue to move on this great place. We thank you. We praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.